So maybe now we'll give you all an opportunity to ask uh, Charles questions, or me if you want, but he's the interesting one up here. Uh, so let's open it up to the floor. So the question is, how does he compare himself to uh, Ken Burns? Well, in the, in the first place, it would be very pretentious of me to compare myself to Ken Burns, who has been doing this masterfully for 25 years. Um, I, I don't think that I have in me the, the capacity or the patience, um, or just, I don't know, for whatever reason, the inclination to make films that are you know, 20 hours long. Um, which he does, you know, he, he makes very long films that take a, a leisurely, extremely deep, very textured look at some subject. Many of his films have been about some aspect of race or class in America, um, sometimes not. Uh, I admire what he does a great deal. I, you know, what I, what I do is different. Question here, um, I'm curious, it sounds like the intercultural skills that you gained at iHouse um, played a big part in your career and in making these um, these documentaries. And I'm curious, um, you know, what do you think that higher education in America can do to contribute to these inter intercultural skills? And perhaps Chancellor Bergino, you can talk about what we're doing here at Berkeley to advance that. <sighs> <laughs> so, uh, so a number of people have heard me quote, actually, it's not original to me, it's original to the president of the University of Mexico, where I was sitting at a dinner table with him. Uh, University of Mexico has 220,000 undergraduate students. Uh, and so I asked him, what was the single most important thing that they tried to teach students at his universities in Mexico? And he said, immediately, he said, intercultural competence. He said that, that to be successful in the 21st century, that the, the people who would be successful would be the people who can move comfortably between different cultures. Uh, uh, of course, you know, we have uh, an extraordinarily culturally diverse uh, popula student population here at, uh, at Berkeley. Uh, we have no majority population. We're one of the very few uh, major universities in the country that doesn't have a majority population. So we immediately, therefore, ethnically are extraordinarily uh, diverse. Uh, when I first came here, I was actually taken aback by the relatively small number of international undergraduate students. And so but from my beginning to when I finished, and that is not yet a forecast, but anyway, uh, 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 at least of when I'm going to finish, uh, uh, we will have quadrupled the number of international undergraduate students. So we've gone up by a factor of four. So there will, Martin, there will never be a difficulty in the future of filling the rooms at iHouse. Uh, the, the, uh, and I actually believe that uh, students learn at least as much from their fellow students as they do from the faculty and, uh, uh, and, and the staff for that matter. And so I think just having a more internationally diverse undergraduate student body will contribute significantly to that. The second is that, of course, one way of learning about col other cultures is to, learn, is to learn their languages. And many of you may know that we've just made a major reinvestment in foreign languages, and foreign language studies here at, at, uh, at Berkeley, uh, so that uh, you can take, for example, uh, we teach more dialects, Indian dialects, than you can take at any university in India. And so we have a huge in, in investment in, in foreign languages here at Berkeley. Uh, then, in addition, there are places like International House and this wonderful program that Martin Brennan uh, has, has on, you know, on moving between cultures and on cultural interactions and understanding other cultures. Uh, but to be honest, we can do much more uh, than we're doing at the, pre at the present time, but I think that will be facilitated by the significantly increased number of international students that we're uh, building up over these four, these four years. Um, well, I, I would say that I'm, I'm very worried about America's condition in this regard. Uh, first of all, I'm very worried about what's happening to American universities. Uh, Chancellor Bergenau is under an enormous amount of financial and, and other pressure, as many other universities are, and many other leaders of universities are, and 
and that I think risks having very deleterious effects on the ability of American higher education to produce the kind of intercultural understanding and cosmopolitanism that I think is very important now. I would say that I'm even more worried about uh, the effect of the current uh, political, financial, uh, economic environment on the ability of the general population to get access to what places like Berkeley have. Um, when, I, when I came to Berkeley in the 1970s, um, tuition was $650 a year. And I'm interested to hear that that's apparently a surprise to many people. Yeah. So uh, needless to say, it's a little bit higher now. And you know, I, I, I'm very disturbed at that. I, I know that financial aid has gone up too, but on a net basis, I, I think there's no question that uh, the role of public universities in the United States, especially the very best public universities, is to some extent in danger now. And I, I hope that uh, Berkeley pulls through. Yeah. So uh, a couple of comments on that. So uh, you might be interested to know that this year, we actually have the largest number of low-income students Berkeley's ever had in its history. And oddly, it's because of the increasing fees. That's a more complex discussion. So the, the yeah. challenge is You're actually, charging people who the can afford to The challenge is actually for the middle class. And so so we, have a, we have a huge problem. Uh, we're going to have a, we're moving towards a three-class system where we will we'll have very good representation of people from low-income families, very good representation of people from high-income families, and the middle class are going, may, or may be largely missing. Now, of course, part of our responsibility is to make sure that that doesn't happen. But there's no doubt, and you know, we've been having uh, incessant conversations about this, it was assumed in California and in the country as a whole that higher education was a public good. And that's no longer accepted. Higher education is now viewed as a private good. And I was talking to some people this morning who have done polling in California of what their attitude is towards increasing cost of education. And 70% said that's fine because they're profiting from it. So there's really been a change in the public attitude towards the value of public education. And that's reflected very directly in Sacramento's unwillingness to, uh, not Sacramento, I mean, Sacramento's just reflecting what they see as the will of the people of the people of California no longer willing to support uh, public higher education, which, and I couldn't agree with you more. I think this is a very dangerous thing for the country. I was, oh, can I give it to you later? Yeah. Or, <laughs> oh, thank you. Um, I was wondering uh, about the reactions you received uh, from the people you interviewed for Inside Job after they'd seen, the, after they'd seen it. Do you still keep in touch with them, for example? <laughs> <laughs> Some of them, obviously not, uh, but most of them, yes. Uh, every, everybody who was in the film, first of all, was invited to screen the film very early on, before it was released. And most of them, in fact, came, uh, including people who you know, don't always just sort of go to film screenings. I mean, George Soros came to see the film. Um, uh, Frederick Mishkin sent a public relations executive in his place. Uh, Glenn Hubbard did not come. Uh, David McCormick did not come. Uh, John Campbell did not come. But, but many of the others did. And in fact, um, at the premiere of the film at the New York Film Festival, uh, nine of the people who were in the film were on stage with me. And, uh, and I've been in touch with them and, and many others uh, who've been in the film. There's a total of, I think, 36 people, something like that, in the film. The film, it, it's known in, in the film world, in the film industry, that uh, you can only tolerate a total of maybe 40 people in a movie before human beings just can't you know, absorb more. And we, we were pushing that limit. Um, but uh, I've been in touch with, with most of the people uh, who are in the film, and most of them are very happy with it. And th those people include George Soros, they include uh, Christine Lagarde, they include Andrew Shang, um, who is a very important person in China. He's actually not Chinese, by the way. Andrew Shang is an incredibly interesting man. He's Malaysian, 
uh, he had a very serious high-level financial job in Malaysia. Then after that, he was the deputy governor of the Hong Kong Central Bank. And then after Hong Kong reverted to China, he became the chief advisor to uh, China's banking regulator, the Chinese equivalent of the Federal Reserve. And he's an absolutely remarkable uh, man. But anyway, that's a long answer to your question. Uh, most, most of the people in the film uh, have seen it and like it, and I am still in touch with them. Um, going back to Inside Job. Sorry. <laughs> going back to Inside Job, I have a three-prong question. First of all, do you think that most of these bankers actually did this with intent or just negligence to try and take advantage of the s small people? <laughs> Second of all, don't you think that borrowers themselves should have been self-regulating? In other words, just because somebody comes to me and tells me, gee, you can do this for free, I don't necessarily take it if it's not good for me. And third of all, you mentioned it tonight and also in your acceptance speech, who exactly should be in jail? Um, okay, so... Uh, uh, in, in the order in which you asked them, uh, did they know or was it just negligence? There, there's a mixture. It depends on the person. You know, there were some surprisingly high-level people who were stunningly ignorant of what was going on. Um, uh, I, I would say that the guys who ran I don't mean the people who ran the mortgage business, but but you know the the, the CEOs of Merrill Lynch and Citigroup during this period were astonishingly unaware of what was going on. As you know, as long as profits were going up and bonuses were going up, that's really kind of all they cared about. And more interestingly, it's kind of all they knew about. Um, and the, the the CEO of Citigroup has said. The, the then CEO of Citigroup, not, not Vikram Pandit, but his predecessor, Chuck Prince, uh, has said that during the period of the bubble, and, and the people I've spoken to tend to believe this, that he was spending over 50% of his time resolving Citigroup's prior legal problems. Citigroup actually had very serious legal and regulatory problems deriving from earlier violations of the law. And he was hired as CEO in large measure because he had a legal background and he could help resolve them. And he was apparently spending the majority of his time on that. Now, does that entirely excuse him? No. There were many other people who knew perfectly well what they were doing. Perfectly well. And we now know this. There, you know, there is documentary evidence that many of these people knew what was going on. And so how do we know that? One way we know that is we know that um, uh, at its very highest levels, the most senior executives of Goldman Sachs made an extremely explicit decision in late 2006 to begin shorting the entire mortgage market at the same time as they were continuing to sell uh, mortgage-backed securities. And, and in fact, they, it is also known that, that their shorts were so large that they realized that their shorts could cause the collapse of the companies they were using to do the shorts, principally AIG. And, uh, and they then started either shorting or buying insurance on uh, AIG. And it is rumored, not yet known, possibly even other financial companies. I could keep you here for a very long time describing the various things that we know people did. Um, Lehman's Repo 105, faking its uh, balance sheet. In, inside Merrill Lynch, one group of traders tried to sell a bunch of this stuff on the open market. They couldn't sell it. So they bribed another group of traders inside Merrill Lynch to buy it from them, to set an, artificial, an artificially high price. It, 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 many, many things are known. Now, how many of these things constitute criminal violations, who knew exactly what, when, you know, that's not my job, that's the job of prosecutors. But it, it is unimaginable that all of this could have gone on without a single person committing a criminal act. And there has not been a single criminal conviction as a result of this crisis, not a single one. We have one last question here. Um, 
Yeah, hi. My question is a follow-up to, to her question about who should be in jail. Now, the question is, do you think that the American legal system is also a Wall Street legal system? Because if you contrast what happened with the financial crisis with what Bernie Madoff did, Bernie Madoff was tried pretty quickly, and he went to prison pretty quickly, and the evidence was all there. So is it because Bernie Madoff stole from the upper, upper class, stole money from rich people, so he went to prison quickly, and the rest of the Wall Street stole from middle income to low income people, so justice is a bit slower when you're poor? <laughs> uh, um, it's, it's not a silly question. I, I, I actually think the explanation is different, however. I don't, I don't think that it's primarily uh, who Madoff stole from. I think it's the fact that what Madoff did had two other characteristics. One is who he was. He was uh, independent of the large financial institutions. He was uh, individually very wealthy, and his firm was individually very wealthy. But he was very, very small relative to, you know, Lehman Brothers or Morgan Stanley or Goldman Sachs or Citigroup. Or, um, and, and he was an outsider in many ways. He was not deeply connected to the Wall Street system. And the second thing was that what he did, there was absolutely no nuance to it at all. You know, there was, there was no way that you could give an excuse, provide an argument. It was, you know, sheer, simple Ponzi scheme fraud uh, in the most literal sense. You know, he said that he had securities positions. He did not have securities positions, etc. And so um, it was a fairly straightforward matter. Um, it was both easy and very clear. Interestingly, there is very substantial evidence that many people in Wall Street knew he was a fraud. And the SEC, in fact, had received six complaints over the prior decade, including very detailed analyses about which it had done nothing. Even more interestingly, uh, there have been some lawsuits recently which have revealed that J.P. Morgan and UBS and possibly others had such uh, strong suspicions about Madoff that by 2007 they were no longer investing their own funds. And in fact, there's a UBS memo. Uh, UBS created a separate subsidiary to deal specifically with Madoff related investments. And they took customers' money and channeled them into Madoff investments. But uh, there was a very explicit memo given to the employees of this group saying, do not ever invest our bank's funds with Bernard Madoff, and do not ever sign a contract with Bernard Madoff. And the bankruptcy administrator in charge of cleaning up the Madoff affair, uh, Irving Picard, has sued J.P. Morgan, HSBC, UBS, and several other financial institutions, alleging that, in fact, they knew or suspected wh what was going on, uh, but did nothing about it because they were profiting from it in various ways. And, I, and is seeking the recovery of uh, very large amounts of money in excess of $10 billion as a result. As to why nobody from the core financial system has been prosecuted as a result of the crisis, I think it's the reverse of the Madoff situation. They are in these very large, extremely powerful, politically powerful, financially powerful institutions in the first place. And in the second place, what they did was very complicated. It, it's not an easy thing. That doesn't mean that it wasn't criminal. It doesn't mean nobody should be investigated or prosecuted. But it would, in fact, be a very complicated, difficult thing to go after them. And of course, they would fight it you know, very, very strongly. And they'd have enormous resources to, to fight it. And I think that uh, for whatever combination of reasons, reasons we may never know, President Obama made a personal decision that he just wasn't going to fight that fight. So, oh, Charles, thank you for this conversation. Thank you. And, uh,